again, we don't take an actual BCSP question. We take the concept and we make a question around that concept. And we're going to cover finance, which is the math part, and the business case for safety, just a small part of it. It's going to be in CSP Domain 2, CHST Domain 4, and SMS Domain 5. So if you take a look at an organization chart, hopefully safety reports to the plant manager or the chief executive officer. If you report to operations or maintenance, you're usually going to have some issues uh, down the line. One of the things that I find it's uh, very efficient, uh, in a bigger company, you'll have an environmental safety and health officer. Uh, sometimes security gets wrapped into this. If we go through some knowledge checks, uh, these are going to be typical questions that talk about what you're going to have to know on the test. In your role as a safety manager, how does your contribution to the creation of the corporate business plan affect safety management and the setting of performance objectives? The business plan outlines the resources required to attain zero injury target. The business plan integrates all facets of the company and company safety objectives. The business plan pinpoints areas needing enhancement and sets specific targets for improvement. The business plan delineates corporate strategy for resource allocation and profit forecasting. Okay, this is a tough question, but it's a corporate business plan. If I didn't add the word safety, then you would sit there and have possibly all of these be correct. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to throw out C and D. Your choices really are between A and B. And what do you think it is? It's going to integrate all facets of the company and company the safety objectives. The record keeping is going to be a few questions on the business. You have to keep three OSHA forms, the OSHA 300, the 300A, and the 301. The OSHA form 300 is a log of all the injuries that are medical treatment, lost time, and restricted at the facility. First aid cases are not on this. You will be often asked, what is a first aid versus a medical treatment? The other logs, the 300A, is a summary that's posted between February 1st and April 30th. That is a very common question. The 301 is a description of all the injuries that are on this log. So we're going to calculate two different rates. One is going to look at the lost time cases that involve days at ways from work and it could be either a restriction or it could be away from work or both you can you know be off for two weeks and come back at light duty or restricted uh, 30 days you count cases up to 180 days and that's a number you should also know so when you calculate what we call the DART or lost workday injury rate we're going to look at the amount of lost day cases, cases away from work. When we want to calculate an incident rate, we look at all the recordable injuries. So the term uh, incident rate is a metric that measures the frequency severity. The total incident case rate or case incident rate is a number of injuries per 100 full-time workers. Originally in 1970 they were thinking let's take the amount of injuries divided by the hours and that's an incident rate which is true but the trouble is when you have that three or four injuries divided by hundreds of thousands of hours the number becomes 0, 0.0 something and people didn't like that so that's why they used 100 full-time workers who are working about 2,000 hours a year or 200,000 to boost this number up you also hear the total recordable incident rate you don't have to know the difference between them but you'll just see these terms inter intertwined a lot of times and it's the same math formula. The DART or the lost time work injury rate is you're tracking the recordable work cases that evolved lost time or restricted lost time at the facility. We never count the day of the injury. And then the last term uh, you're going to hear is the EMR. Insurance companies have what they call an experience modification rate. They put this rate in a three-year average in the United States, and then you're compared to the losses of other companies in the same industry. So if you manufacture valves, 
you're compared to other valve manufacturers. If you're a concrete construction company, you're compared with other construction companies. EMR of 1 means your average compared to your industry. That means you have the average losses of an EMR of everybody else in your industry. If you have a rate above 1, like a 1.2, you are higher for losses than the rest of your competitors in that industry. If you have a rate of 0 0.8, you're much lower than the industry average. You have to know what that means because you always seem to get a question on it. So we're going to calculate the first one is a dart rate. It's called a days away restricted or transfer. You get a lot of acronyms. What we want to do is calculate the amount of lost time cases. Then we're going to divide it by the hours, but we're also going to multiply it times 200,000. The OSHA incident rate, the total case incident rate or total recordable incident rate, is the total amount of injuries recorded on the OSHA 300, lost time in medical treatment, but not first aid, times 200,000 divided by the hours at work. Okay, how does the EMR impact overall profitability? A, it solely rates safety performance. B, the EMR influences future insurance premiums costs for your company. It is determined by industry associations and measures customer satisfaction. We know that's not right. D, EMR ranks your company and its competitor based on experience and tenure in business. So what do you think? Influences future premiums. Again, they're going to look at it. Everybody's going to look at your EMR. When they ask for this, you will know your EMR. Other companies will look at it. The insurance companies will decide. Your higher losses than average, we've going to put your premium at this amount of money. So if we take a typical OSHA 300, we have several cases, six of them total, recorded. We're going to go see how many lost time cases. Okay, so we had one lost time where from a fracture he missed 12 days and then was restricted 15 days. Another lost time where he was restricted at the job. That's a restricted lost time. He cannot do 100% of his job that he normally does in the week. Another lost time where he fell over a box, restricted seven days, and I mean, restricted 30 days, missed seven days. The fourth lost time case is the person just missed three days of work. So we're going to calculate the DART based on the prefill form. And I brought the numbers up on the uh, exercise here. So what is the DART from the one we had? Remember, we had four lost time restricted cases. They worked 100,000 hours. You're expected to know the multiplication number, the factor, 100 employees working 2,000 2, hours a year. So what is the DART rate? 2, 4, 6, or 8? And if you're going to watch this on YouTube, you can just pause the video. The answer is 8. We have four recordable lost time cases times 200,000 divided by 100,000 hours is equal to 8. Now we're going to do the incident rate calculation. Remember, it could be TCIR, TRIR, IR, incident rate. And we're going to use the handout again. We notice we had six recordable cases. Remember, we do not count first aid cases. So the hours we worked was 100,000. So what is the TCIR? 4, 8, 12, 24. Very good. It's 12. Six cases times 200,000 divided by 100,000 hours is a rate of 12. That means really 12% of the workers got hurt that year, which is not good. The industry average for constructions around two, manufacturing, excuse me, injury average constructions around about 2.7 or three. The construction, I mean, manufacturing is about three, give or take about 0.3. A knowledge check. Like all investment strategies, the objective is to see a concrete return on the invested resources. Which of the following goal setting approaches might be effective at justifying upfront cost? of a new or enhanced safety measure. A, lagging safety metrics. 
B, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely criteria. C, profit forecasts. D, setting strategic goals, for importing improvement areas, and beginning with ideal scenarios. Another tough question. I call these scenario-based questions. They're long and they're wordy, and you just have to try it. So we're trying to make a goal-setting approach that's effective. So which one do you think it is? It's going to be specific, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely criteria. You want to sit there and talk about how much money something costs, what the reduction could be for injuries, and how easy is this to implement or is it attainable. Okay, you have to know these numbers if you're a safety professional. And we'll go over examples. So one of the things is how much does injuries cost? If you're doing uh, the SMS, Safety Management uh, Specialist, you're going to get a lot of questions related to this. But this is something you have to know. A typical case, a company has two back injuries a year. You can see that this person's back is bent about uh, 75 degrees from the horizontal. That's, that's asking for a bad injury. Lifting metal parts, putting them on a pallet. Very poor. The average cost is $50,000 in injury. If things go unchanged with no inflation, what will be the cost after 12 years? A million, two, two million dollars, five million dollars, twelve million dollars. Very good. A is the answer. Two injuries times 50000 is $100,000 a year times 12 years is $1.2 million. Very good. Knowledge check. You notice I have a lot of knowledge checks because, remember, this area is going to be very dense on the SMS and the CSP particularly. You're going to get us several questions on the ASP. How should you respond to the chief financial officer's request to justify the expenditure on safety training for all your employees in the company? Very common uh, question that you might get from the finance people. You're going to develop a cost-benefit analysis, A. Create an injury trend analysis covering the past five years. C. Compare the number of reported injuries before and after the training. D. Calculate the return on investment rate. This is a tough question because there's a couple of them that are pretty good, but they want the best answer. Develop a cost-benefit analysis. Again, we're going to tell them what it costs and what kind of benefits we're going to do from the training. This is a lagging indicator so we want to spend the money now so this one is kind of you know not a bad question if you had training the year before but we want to sit there and try to expend it we want to say we have so many injuries it costs us this much we hope training will reduce the injuries 30 percent 20 percent when i go out there at companies and they're double the injury rate i can say i can cut it in half by doing monthly manager training monthly employee training doing job site walk-arounds with every crew in the departments and as well as having all your you know site hazards fixed and all your OSHA programs you might get a question on fleet safety this is also related to the uh, business case because many companies have uh, company vehicles they use and then there's a whole fleet of trucking uh, the transportation sector is the number one injury for out of the 5,000 some deaths every year in the United States, transportation is 40% all the time. It's been number one for years. So they're going to ask you uh, an accident rate. They don't call it an incident rate. We drive $4 million miles on our trucks a year. We had 12 accidents. What's the accident rate per million miles? Three, four, six, or 12. It's a simple question. Very good. It is three. Twelve accidents divided by four million miles is 3.0. And I spelled accident wrong. 
Return on investment. This is a popular question for the CSP and the SMS, as well as you might get one on two of these in the ASP. The company averages four back injuries lifting 50 pound bags of food. Each injury costs $50,000. Where am I getting the $50,000? It's from safety pays. You know, plus I've seen enough of these injuries. Uh, you can always get injuries that cost much less and injuries that cost $500 a million. The vacuum lift assist. In this picture here, 20000 This is one of my students that we talked about this. These are very cheap to get. They tried one. What's the payback period in months? 1.2 months, 2.4 months, 3.6 months, 5.0 months. Now this is tough because we give it to you in years. Four back injuries, 50 pound bags a year. So we have four injuries a year times 50,000. You gotta put this in months. This is a little bit tougher. The answer is 1.2 months. This is a fast payback. $50,000 per injury times four injuries a year is $200,000 a year. Divided by 12 months, it's costing us $16,000 a month for these back injuries. We're buying an item for $20,000. We divide it by the cost per month, it's 1.2 months. You don't take a look at it as a you know, a monthly thing. That's a tough issue. But this is what they may do on a test. They may give you something that's cost per year and then they want the payback period in months. Uh, the thing is, this is an incredible, uh, quick, easy device. And once this company bought one, they bought a whole bunch of them because the payback period is less than a month. You're, you're reducing the injuries. Managers have to uh, demonstrate commitment. A good manager is going to be able to have a good safety program. They attend the meetings. For example, last year uh, OSHA has an emphasis on food industry. I went to 12 food companies. All the plant managers went to every required training. Every single one of them. That's what we're talking about, commitment. They're going to follow the goals and they're going to be example by knowing what the rules are and what the employees are expected to follow. So to demonstrate leadership and commitment to safety and health, managers must be an example knowing and follow the rules employees are expected to follow. B, only the supervisor and policy making, involve only the supervisors and policy making on safety and health issues. C, order the low level staff, lower level staff to conduct safety and health meetings. D, place the responsibility of success on the employees. So we can probably throw out uh, a couple of them real quick. Very good. The answer is A. Be an example. You're always going to get this question. They're always going to ask you about the manager. Uh, be example. Lead by example. Um, you know, is a very, very common question to expect on the test. Hazard identification. Part of your uh, business case is making sure. Once a month, we do a site audit. All the crews, all the facilities, all the departments. We look for hazards and then we want them fixed. Somebody's got to track them and it's usually going to be safety or the department head of that department. So over on the uh, left photo, we have uh, the number one item for compressed gas cylinders. The cylinders are not secured from falling over. Uh, the propane cylinders have to be stored in a ventilated area. So that's going to be a common citation. Number or the right hand photo is a problem that's 25% of all injuries slipping on water at the facility or slipping at the same surface. Here you can see an oil sheen, there's water, people drove through it, that's not good. You can't imagine what a forklift would be like trying to stop on an area with water. So we want to get the managers and everybody else to stop, get somebody else, stay there, and 
get it cleaned up right away. I first saw it at Walmart where the associate sees uh, water. They say, I'm over here in aisle 17. There's water on the floor from something that broke. We need to get somebody with a bucket and a broom. I'll stay here and keep people away. We have to get away from, it's not my job, it's the janitor's job. This is an issue that affects everybody at the facility. We want to get it fixed right away. And also, we want to review information, make sure everything has got uh, the protection. You know, there's a lot of required programs. You're going to work on this panel box. It's 480 volts. You want to make sure you have an electrical safety program and an arc flash safety program because we can get a pretty serious burn if we're working on live electrical. OSHA would want you to shut off the panel box if it's possible, but sometimes it is not possible when you're trying to find a short or an electrical break. Uh, injury logs, incident investigation are all part of the records you can look at when you're taking charge of safety to see what has happened in the past. And OSHA is always going to look at least five years of records because you have to keep five years of the records plus the current year. A lot of companies after a while will develop a safety committee. Voluntary protection program is a recognition program that OSHA has recognized 2,500 companies in the United States as having exceptional safety programs. So this uh, company had a uh, safety committee. One of the things that I always push is get the safety committee out to do these monthly audits. They can go out there, they can see it, you can do groups of two, or you can bring everybody out there, but the idea is there'll be a set of eyes when somebody else comes in, because if you're working in that department, you may not see the hazard because you have not had a loss and you just don't recognize it. But another thing they did in this company was they're going to go buy some gloves. One thing about gloves, no glove will fit everybody comfortably. You have to have a couple different types of brands, two to three to five types of brands, because people are not going to like one set of gloves. It might be too stiff, might not be. I'm always checking out the latest and greatest gloves. I want to have gloves that are comfortable, flexible, as well as being cut resistant and puncture resistant. So the committee members went through it and they started seeing people starting to wear the gloves. Remember, we're coming from a facility that gloves are new and most people didn't want to wear them. You're trying to prevent the lacerations and punctures, so this is what you, you go and do. Knowledge check. Again, another long wordy question. You know, when you're going to get these business case or safety management questions, they're going to be long. When managing large work sites with numerous contractors and employees, effective communication becomes increasingly challenging. Which communication method is the most effective for promoting cohesive safety across the entire project team? So this is going to be a construction question. A comprehensive public address system with extensive coverage. Establishing a safety committee includes representatives from all employers and contractors on the job. Distributing a detailed work report on safety matters. Holding site-wide safety meetings every Monday for all project members. Well, we know A and C are not going to be good. So take your choice. What do you think? It's a B or D. What's the best answer? Very good. The best answer is B. They like safety committees. And I would make sure, again, you know, all... Uh, you know, if you have union sites, you want the union involved too. Uh, site weight safety meetings, these are also good. These are both good answers, but they're always going to look for a safety committee. Any questions on anything else that we covered? We did a short one today. I'm going to stop the share. I appreciate everybody coming in. Uh, it'll be posted on YouTube, and uh, next month we'll have a different topic. And eventually we'll get all 50 topics. Uh, we're at 10 topics now, and next 40 months we'll have the other ones covered. Thank you very much for coming, and I appreciate it.